probably why you're guessing there's a tax panel. Um, but what is very interesting is when you have money in politics, you have money and it's going to go to politicians, people want an efficient vehicle to put money into politics, and the efficient vehicle happens to be tax-exempt entities or tax entities, maybe, as we'll talk about today. And that means tax lawyers get involved. So I thought it was, it was important if you're going to talk about not only whether money should be there, but how it gets there, and this is how it gets there. And obviously, I mean, depending on how you like it, this came to light 330 days ago, as Paul Perrin on the Tax Prop Club likes to consistently remind us when there became an IRS investigation into um, the way the IRS is trying to figure out how money gets into politics and whether or not these charitable organizations were valid or not. So with that being said, there's currently six government investigations going on into the, into the, into the um, IRS investigation of these various entities, and that's one of the genesis of having this panel. So with us today, we're lucky enough to have three of what I would consider the best tax people in the country on this topic. Um, we have Phil Hackney. Phil is a professor at LSU. He has worked with the chief counsel's office. In, in, had he been there a couple months ago, he would have been heavily involved in some of this stuff. And, um, and he writes extensively on this topic and <coughs> going to talk about today the um, should the IRS never target um, taxpayers. And next to him we have uh, Don Tobin. And Don is a professor at Ohio State. He's written extensively on the topic also in the nonprofit arena. He's one of the experts in the country on it. And Don actually worked at DOJ at the time. There's a tax part of DOJ for those who don't know, and he was on the tax side of the DOJ investigating some of these same issues. And lastly, we have Lloyd Meyer, who's a professor at Notre Dame. <coughs> Lloyd is also the, is, was the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at Notre Dame. He is is eminently qualified in the area of nonprofits. He practiced in the area for a very long time in DC. He, I don't, he's a theoratical person, so you understand the theater I learned last night, and, and <laughs> it's necessary to be a good um, advocate in the matters. So, and Lloyd will talk lastly about the IRS policy and the, con and the um, crisis of confidence associated with it. So with that, I don't want to take up time, so if you have questions, um, and I'll let Phil get started. All right. Thank you guys for being here, thank you, David, and uh, thank you for uh, um, all the Law Review students who worked diligently to put this together. You guys did a great job getting together a great group and uh, keeping it moving along the So, big appreciation to Val Verizon and all the folks that put time into it. So, I'm, I'm going to talk about should the IRS never target taxpayers. Um, so it, I kind of take it in part, there's a Paul Ryan quote, not the Paul Ryan that we have here today. Um, I was thinking at first we had Paul Ryan, and then I found out, ah, it's Campaign Legal Center. But uh, Paul Ryan, after the um, Tea Party scandal, I'll refer to it as a scandal because it's been, that, been treated in that way sometimes. Um, Ryan said, we know that the IRS did target people based upon their political beliefs. Who cares? whether they're right or left. And this is pretty much, I think, a consistent reaction that a lot of folks have had. There's been some pulling back in terms of whether there was some dramatic uh, scandal or not. But when anybody looks at kind of what the IRS did, there's a sense, well, there was something wrong about what was taking place there. So I want to kind of think about that aspect today. Um, it started as a result of laws that require the IRS to monitor tax-exempt organizations as to whether they qualify for the tax-favored status, tax-exempt status, or not. And part of those requirements within the category of the groups that were at primary issue, social welfare organizations, is that they can lobby all they want, something we haven't talked about here much today. We're focusing mostly on, within the tax-exempt world, we tend to think of as intervening in a political campaign, meaning contributing to campaigns or saying vote for or against Thor or whoever it might be. IRS is required to monitor these things and um, it uh, was doing that activity and got itself into a uh, bath of hot water. Um, so my paper, instead of thinking about whether we should have these laws or not and what 
functions they serve, is trying to focus in on the capacity for us as a government to administer these types of laws. Um, do we have the ability to actually administer them and what is the level of administration that we can give to them? My sense, unfortunately, because I've, I'm inclined that there should be some limitations here, I think the evidence that Nick presented and such is disturbing enough that there should, we should try to have some limits here, but my sense is that our capacity, both as in terms of the money we're willing to put towards the administration angle of this, and in terms of our ability as a, a population as a, of citizens to accept that our government is handling this right, are, are both low. Um, and so it's necessarily circumscribed what we can do within the government. And so as we think about whether we should have these things, I think we also need to be thinking about how they should be carried out and with what um, degree of intensity our government should be engaged in these matters. So my um, paper focuses on the motivation for my paper, I should say, comes from kind of a surprise regarding the Inspector General's report regarding the IRS. The, the primary critique was that the IRS was using names as a means of figuring out organizations it was going to review closer. And what bothers me about that in part is that it's kind of what the IRS does. Um, it comes up with audits um, that are based on three things, and mind you that the part of the IRS that was engaged in this was not really the auditing division necessarily, different division, but in terms of audits, it uses three things. There's a diff score, um, and that's something carefully guarded by the IRS in terms of figuring out who it's going to audit for monetary matters. Um, and it, it, depending on what issues you declare on your return, you might have a higher or lower diff score, and many organizations try and spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. There's also information returns. You get the 1099, W-2s, etc. It's all these information that the IRS collects, and when things don't match up, that can trigger an auditor as well. And then finally, there's this issue of related party audits, and that is where the IRS is going to pull in a group of different parties um, that are related to one another, particularly high wealth individuals, businesses, etc. You'll pull all the businesses that are related in some sense. So that the IRS generally does this and that the Inspector General's critique would seem to be so diametrically opposed to that kind of concept bothered me. And let me give you an example. So the determinations function was the function of the IRS that came in der, under all the hot water. And they were um, searching in their computer systems diligently for organizations with the names Tea Party, 9-11, and Patriots also doing some searches for certain political beliefs. And that, that, that's probably a little bit more problematic. I'm focusing on the names. And the, the part that bothered me, and so I, I think back to, all right, so if the IRS is going along and it's got this application system coming through, and I'll talk about how many it gets through and how many employees it has, talking about the capacity for administering the system. But assume the IRS gets in an organization named Really Bad Charity Incorporated. And Really Bad Charity Incorporated is bilking parents of disabled children. And they don't explain that in their form, but they figure that out based on the situation. And it turns out there's a couple other really bad charities that apply, and so the IRS, and in some, they've even accepted into the, the organization. And so the IRS then, I think, should be called upon to pull all really bad charities, search their database for those organizations. Arguably, that's something that they were doing in the Tea Party scandal, I, I think problematically, though. I, I think they're two different things, and I think that's because of the political angle and because of our capacity for dealing with these types of things. <coughs> so, um, if you um, bring this back to the, yeah, um, so let, 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 me, let me come to um, sort of the vision I have of what the IRS's capacity is. And this is sort of a lens or a metaphor that I've taken to, to viewing the organization through. Um, 
probably not exactly correctly, but at least it, it, it gives an idea of the way I think we often are thinking about it. So Dr. Seuss wrote a book called If I Ran the Circus. We have young Morris McGurk who sees a big vacant lot and he imagines this Circus McGurkus that's going to be the world's greatest show on the face of the earth or wherever you go. And there is a Mr. <coughs> Steelock that runs a shack right next to this big vacant lot. And he's an old gentleman with a pipe in his mouth. And um, Morris McGurk imagines that Mr. Sneelock is going to carry out about 50 different amazing functions in his Circus McGurkus. And you realize as you go through these things, there's no way that uh, Mr. McGurk could do any of these things. Mr. Sneelock, excuse me. Um, but it's, it's exciting to watch you seeing this kid's imagination. Um, but he can't realistically do them. We know we cannot carry these things out. And I think we often, um, the government, um, our populace, the folks that are focusing on these things, thinks of the capacity for our government as something greater than it in fact is. It can do a lot of stuff. The, the government can do some pretty amazing things. It's a pretty amazing organization, given its budget and its mission, etc. It does some impressive stuff, but it has significant limitations on what those can be. Um, so, I think understanding what is the capacity of the government becomes important. What can it do becomes very important. So, in 1973, we had about 70,000 IRS employees, 1,000 in the exempt organizations area. Um, there were a lot less applications for exempt organizations coming in, and maybe about 20,000 or so. I'm, I'm trying to get some data on that. There's a filer commission report back from the 70s that gives some data on that, um, but looking into it. Today, you have about 90,000 IRS employees. 875 are in the exempt organizations area. So it has shrunk, if anything. Um, what are the computer systems like at the IRS? So this form that people were filing for social welfare organizations came in paper. It comes in paper still today. They receive about 60 to 70,000 paper applications. Each of these forms are from 8 to 12 pages with all sorts of additional information that's attached onto them, including bylaws and articles, and then you can have the website, etc. You have about 200 employees that actually look at all this data that's coming. Some of it's pretty simple. It's the Boy Scouts are coming in, um, Girl Scouts, uh, PTA associations, and these are pretty straightforward, but there are a lot of doozies um, as uh, Richard and Fran have been talking about these complex corporate operations that theoretically these folks are supposed to be looking over. And Fran's exactly right, is that that group doesn't begin to have the sophistication to be able to actually understand what's going on with these organizations. So that organization has to necessarily centralize in some capacity. That's arguably, and the IRS has said that this is kind of what they were trying to do. They were trying to make sure that they had some sort of consistency. And that effort to get some sort of consistency is exactly what got them into hot water. So um, the additional thing to bring into this is while tax law is complex, <coughs> if we're talking about numbers and we're talking about money, of organizations and how much somebody owes. While there is some gray area in there, there's much less than you find in this tax-exempt organizations area. Um, it uh, is necessarily terribly ambiguous. The IRS has lost cases before on the definition of education because it was void for vagueness. Theoretically, they've cleared that up. But the area of law is notoriously very ambiguous, hard to know what's going on, and this leads to these very significant problems of what I refer to as a, a duty of consistency. Um, and there have been a number of cases in this area, and something that I'd like to think about within this paper is what does this role of duty of consistency um, mean in this area of thinking about politics in particular. So, if, to get an idea of this idea of duty of consistency, um, the basic idea is if the IRS treats 
Brad um, as owing tax on a certain transaction, but Fran comes along and does the same transaction and she does not owe tax, Brad's going to come to court and say, hey, this was unfair. And there have been cases, there was a famous IBM case against Rand Corp, well, against the IRS, where Rand Corp got the exact same thing and developed <coughs> this idea of duty of consistency. My sense is that the frustration here with respect to the look at the Tea Party and the way that we were screening these organizations springs from a duty of consistency. Usually this duty of consistency is the ultimate result, i.e., when the IRS makes its final determination, did it differ from the determinations it made as to the others? Here, we had a slightly different situation, which is, it was the actual process of exam where that question gets brought up. And I want to think about how that plays out. So, um, I think the, a big question is, what are the goals of the determination function? Um, it's to ensure that the organization status gets status in some timely manner, um, but it, that it's accurate in some fashion. Right now, it's not at all being done in any kind of timely fashion. Um, it's too slow, um, and lots of organizations are waiting around. In the Tea Party case, I think that there was deep frustration <coughs> because many of these organizations were sitting around for two years until they got status, if not longer, and being asked incredibly complex questions. And so I think the government and politicians need to think very carefully about how they go about doing this activity. Um, so in thinking about this, I think it's important to think about the different categories of exempt organizations that we have. And thinking about this exemption function and determinations function. We, um, the, the classic organization that probably most of you are familiar with within this exempt organization sector are charitable organizations. Those are organizations that qualify under 501c3. And the determinations function is probably the most important there because what comes along with that C3 status is the ability to deduct your charitable contributions. And so focusing assets in that area is probably the most important. Additionally, um, there are about two trillion in assets there in C3s, um, about four trillion total within the exempt organization sector. If we start looking in the other areas that the IRS is trying to administer this, it's still a relatively small amount of money that they're worried about. C4s, the social welfare organizations that were most at heart here, there's only about 100 billion in assets in C4s. Um, of course, these are notoriously soft figures. It's not clear entirely, but these are best estimates in terms of what the IRS has regarding information reporting. There's also business leaks, which are integral to this. About 60 billion there, and we might throw in labor organizations, and I don't have the data specifically, but it's not that much money that we're talking about. In that review function, um, should, we should keep in mind that to show a duty of consistency violates, so let, let me come back to the duty of consistency. Um, to show a duty of consistency violation, the most crucial thing and the ones where it will be the most significant are going to be where other similarly situated people have not been selected for audit for similar reasons, and to discriminatory selection based on race, religion, or based on a desire to prevent constitutional rights are an issue. This leads me to suggest that in most cases, the IRS does not need to worry as much about this duty of consistency. Um, if we're talking about the really bad charity, they're probably on relatively sound footing because they're looking at a lot of organizations. But when it comes to religion and politics, the IRS needs to tread with a lot more circumspection. Um, there you are getting into areas where you might be challenging that question. And the very activity of zeroing in on organizations when you have a limited capacity to do that might very well trigger one of these problems. Um, mouth is dry today. <laughs> so, um, while there are those who argue about whether there is even a duty of consistency, the fact that there's a line of cases along these lines when dealing with religion or politics, the organization is necessarily um, heading into the area that this is going to apply. And so I think here is where 
Um, the IRS, given its substantial lack of resources, and I think this is something that is not going to change. It might modestly be enhanced. We might modestly enhance the budget of the exempt organization sector, but I think it's doomed to be mired in not having enough people to do it. This might indicate that it shouldn't even do this at all in these very specific areas, but I would personally be more comfortable with, and I've got some more thought to do in this area, of enforcing it and tending to enforce it towards the high flyers. This has traditionally been the way that the IRS has dealt with these issues. Most commissioners have not wanted to touch this stuff, come anywhere near close to it. Um, when I joined the Office of Chief Counsel, I used to talk with Paul Asatura, who was our longtime sort of politics guru, and he explained that no rational uh, commissioner wants to head into this hornet's nest of an area, and it really is a hornet's nest of an area. It, if we're talking about the good, the bad, and the, quote, ugly of um, politics and money, I've been seeing the ugly aspect of it. So I, I have good <coughs> friends now who receive death threats from people, and they were, as far as I'm concerned, doing the best they could under the circumstances, and they're ending up in the wrong place at the wrong time as a result of the IRS trying to administer this activity. Um, so what did former commissioners do? They didn't touch it. Um, in the mid-2000s, Everson came in and liked um, the area. There was, he got attention from it, and the IRS moved and created the PACI project and trying to come up with some ways of having um, a rational enforcement. He's looking at these organizations, etc. And the IRS spent huge <coughs> amounts of its resources trying to be perfect, trying to make sure that they're matching up these facts in the right way. And I think they end up expending too much resources towards that area. I think it's better to pull back out of that area. Whether that means that it should pull out entirely, I, I don't think so. I think it belongs, I, and that's not for this paper, but I think there are very good reasons for us to be there. Um, and I think with that, I'll move on so we have more time for discussion. So thank you very much for, for having uh, me here today, and I appreciate all the work from the Law Journal and putting this together. Uh, it's rare that tax professors feel popular in any way in this crisis. <laughs> it certainly made some of us a little more popular, uh, at least in the press, if not in the classroom. Um, so I want to talk to you today a little bit about the IRS crisis and also about where I see maybe the next crisis or, or the next move. And, and to understand what I'm talking about today, I have to go back a little bit and give you a little bit of, of history of how these organizations interrelate. Because if I don't, none of this really makes any sense. So let's go back to pre-2000. And before 2000, we had uh, a, a, a mechanism, a statutory structure, that basically did not require disclosure of tax-exempt organizations that were engaged in political activity. The code, the, the statutory structure, relied on election law to deal with that disclosure. And there was a feeling that election law was not doing that well enough, at least by the people who had the majority of votes in Congress. There was a feeling that disclosure, there needed to be more disclosure. And um, this came actually from, during the campaign, McCain, uh, Senator McCain at the time, there was something called Republicans for Clean Air, it turned out to be an independent group that was running ads against McCain, it turned out to be by the Wiley brothers, which was, were uh, friends of, of, of uh, President Bush, and so there, and that did not have to be disclosed based on a whole set of election law rules. And so McCain and Feingold joined together in what I think of as McCain-Feingold 1, though nobody else seems to call it that, um, <laughs> and amended the Internal Revenue Code and provided that political organizations under the code needed to disclose their contributions and their expenditures. And if they didn't, they had to pay a tax. And once you did that for political organizations, of course, and, and I think the first person I read who wrote about this, I think actually she testified about it, was Professor Hill who said, if you do this, people are just going to move to C-Corps. They're just going to move to another entity. 
And so that's part of what we saw. So let me give you a little understanding of these entities, why you would move, and then we can kind of go to what I really want to say. So the way the tax exempt world is set up, and this is a gross exaggeration, we really have three types of entities in this area. One is the 501c3 charities. That's what everybody thinks of when they think of tax exempt organizations. When you give money to a charity, depending on your tax situation, you generally get to deduct that. And so that is considered a subsidy to the charity. Now, in addition, when the charity makes money, most of the time, it doesn't have to pay tax on what it makes. And so both the income of the charity is tax exempt, unless it's what's called unrelated business income, and donations to the charity are deducted. So we think of C3s as being really the, the, the gold standard of charities. Now, a C3 is specifically prohibited by statute from intervening in a political campaign for or against a candidate. So in general, we think of C3s as being non-political. There's a second category, which generally is C4s, 5s, and 6s, which are social welfare organizations, labor unions, and business leagues. They, contributions to them are not deductible, so they're not as attractive, but they are allowed to engage in election activity, but that can't be their primary function. And then we have 527 organizations, and 527 organizations are political organizations, and they are allowed to intervene in elections. In fact, that has to be their primary purpose. Their income is not taxed, but again, <coughs> contributions to the organization are not tax deductible. So the way to think about it is we have our charities, which can be tax deductible. We have everybody else that's allowed to engage in the activity without having to pay tax. So that's their benefit. So pre-2000, charities couldn't engage in politics. Everybody else could, and there was no disclosure required unless you were subject to election. So when you change that and you made 527 subject to disclosure, of course, nobody wants to be a 527 because nobody wants to disclose. So organizations move to C4. Well, the problem is a lot of the organizations that moved to C4s actually weren't C4s. They weren't social welfare organizations. They were actually political <coughs> organizations. And they were political organizations masquerading as C4s in order to avoid disclosure. And so the question that the IRS had to grapple with is, are these entities really C4s? And if they're not, they're circumventing congressional intent with regard to disclosure. Now we, if you got to read our election loss listserv, you, would, you know, because of McCutcheon, you would just not be able to read anything else, so I have learned to hit delete much more often. <laughs> but even McCutcheon is getting this whole series of disclosure emails that I've been reading for the last two days. So there's lots of us who have serious disagreement about disclosure. That's fine. But there's not much disagreement about what 527 says, it might not be constitutional, and what C4 says, and what congressional intent was when it passed 527. And that was for disclosure of political organizations. So we could debate whether that's good or bad. But the move from 527 to C4 is an attempt to circumvent a clear policy of the United States, a clear statutory policy. And so when the IRS started doing this investigation, it started to get itself in trouble. And I will say, you know, it's hard to know each individual organization, but when you look at something, you know, from a person who practiced in this area, and you had an organization that said it was the Tea Party, and that it was going to go out and try to elect candidates and change America, it was a little hard to not see why maybe that was actually a 527 and not a C4. Now the problem is, the Tea Party, unlike, I was about to say the Tea Party, unlike the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, is less organized, but I'm not actually sure that's a fair statement for either of those parties if you've been involved. But the Tea Party is less organized than the Democratic or Republican Party, and it means that just because somebody has put Tea Party in their name, it doesn't actually mean that they're actually going to try to get a candidate elected. So it's a little harder to just go on the name, but you can at least see why the IRS worked on the name. So that's where we find ourselves now. We find ourselves with this move to C4s, so then you have a push by people like me to say, we've got to tighten up the regulations to the C4s, to the social welfare organizations, and we have this IRS rule that had just come out, um, and in other forums I've written about, about that rule. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about it too much today, 
But um, what the rule was trying to do was put some structure into what made something a social welfare organization so we could determine if it qualified for that. And if it doesn't qualify for that, presumably it has to go back to the 527 area and therefore disclose. So that's the real push here. Now, you know, I think it's, it's kind of funny, especially when you get to hear uh, Professor Smith talk, because I think both of our sides, depending on what's going on, like to talk about the sky is falling, right? We're both crazy or whatever's <laughs> happening, the sky is falling, the world is going to change. Um, and I, I think in the C4 realm, some of the opponents of the regulations have talked about just how much the sky is falling and how much the IRS is just trying to uh, destroy democracy. I actually think the IRS is just trying to put the rules back the way they were supposed to be in the first place. The rules that haven't been enforced. You're supposed to have, you know, you're, you're not supposed to be primarily engaged in politics if you're in the C4 context. They're just trying to straighten out what that means. But here's what I really wanted to talk to you today about. And the question is, that I struggle with is, does any of this really matter? Which is really pathetic, because that's what I spent 13 years writing about. <laughs> in, in 2007, many of the same, some of the same people here were at a symposium at UNC, and I presented a paper on the question of whether taxable entities would be the next loophole. Would people move from tax-exempt entities to taxable entities to avoid disclosure? And at that time, for lots of reasons, there were some tax reasons, but there was also Citizens United hadn't been decided, so there was a ban on certain corporate spending. Um, my ultimate conclusion was they weren't going to be so great at the time. Now, I can't imagine why they're not what everybody's going to move to if the IRS does actually succeed in proposing these regulations, if the proposed regulations become final. And so, for a minute, I actually want to talk about why. Because when I say this, people always come back to me with certain either tax or other types of responses. And, and some of those, I think, don't completely understand what the system is. So the first thing that happened to make it attractive to use taxable entities is Citizens United. And there's a lot of confusion often about what Citizens United does or what it didn't do. We've heard today some clarity that Citizens United still didn't allow corporations to actually give to candidates. But what Citizens United makes clear is that a, a taxable corporation can engage in independent advocacy on behalf of a candidate. Taxable corporations can engage in independent <coughs> advocacy on behalf of a candidate. They can't coordinate with the candidate, but they can engage in independent advocacy. So I can start Tobin Inc. and I can run campaign commercials for Professor Hill's husband. No problem, if he runs again. <laughs> Right? <laughs> so Citizens United has opened up tax entities to be a campaign vehicle. The second thing that happened, one of the, one of the problems that we have to deal with when we're talking about tax entities, is what the tax situation is. And now the tax situation has changed, and I think that's going to make these more attractive. So my basic premise here is if the IRS doesn't at the same time try to clarify how tax entities work, they're going to be the next way that groups push the envelope. So how would it work in a taxable entity? Well, the key is, what are the tax consequences? Because if I have no tax consequences, taxable entities are just as good as tax-exempt entities. Neither have to pay any debt. So that's our first question. Now, what people will say, just out of interest for the students, how many of you take in federal income tax? That's pretty good. <laughs> I'm really, is it required here? No. Nope. Oh, I'm really impressed. Good <laughs> teacher. All right. <laughs> That's great. So, uh, um, so there's a provision of the Internal Revenue Code that would let you deduct as ordinary and necessary business expenses. But that provision specifically prohibits the deduction for political expenditures. So in theory, you know, I can't claim my contributions and income and then get an offsetting deduction because I'm not allowed the deduction. So you would have this tax. And so people will say to me, well, there's a 35% tax you're going to have to pay. The problem is, what is the income of the corporation? Are the contributions to the organization income for tax purposes? And if they're not, then the organization has no income. There's no tax. They're great entities. And if it does, they really stand. So it's a central question of whether or not they have income. So let's talk about whether they have income. So there's two basic <coughs> theories that I like that I think are going to be 
problematic uh, for people trying to stop tax calamities. So when we think about theories about whether you had income, right, we can think first about a pooling theory. But we're all pooling our money together. And the example that uh, a Professor Polsky uses when he talks about the pooling theory is people building a fence in a neighborhood. We're all going to contribute a little bit of money, and we're all going to build this fence. Well, there's no tax to the entity in the middle before you pool, or right after you pool to build the fence. We're just all putting our money together. Um, I think that breaks down in this context because you're not really directing what happens. You're pooling, you're mixing, you're <coughs> identity, and then you're So I don't think you get to win on a pooling theory. The next one is, is like a quasi-trust theory, and that was used in a case about telephones. Do they even have telephones anymore? <laughs> no, must be. Um, and, and the TV station was collecting the money from the telephone and then paying it out. And the question was, does the TV station have income on all the money it takes in? And the answer was no. It's holding it in quasi-trust for the people who contributed, and therefore we don't have any tax on that. But that really doesn't work here either, because the people giving are not, in most cases, very directing about the money. And in fact, the more directing they are, the more there's federal election rules that will <coughs> actually give them problems. So I don't think the quasi-trust theory works very well. So here I'm sitting pretty happy. I'm thinking, OK, these taxable entities are not going to be very good people. And then you look at it. what about gifts? Now when I give money to a political person, absent a bribe, I'm not actually expecting something in return. I'm hoping they win, but I'm not actually expecting something in return. And so that makes the contribution to the corporation seem like a gift. For those of you with federal income tax, with detached and disinterested generosity, right? And so if it's a gift to the organization, right, under what sector? 102? <laughs> no income. Can't help myself. Under 102, no income to the organization. Wow. Okay, now let's say it's not a, so then you say, well, wait a minute, maybe there's a gift tax. Well, I was screaming for years about how there should be a gift tax on transfers to C4 social welfare organizations, and I lost. Right, the IRS stood up about two years ago, and they basically said, we're not going to enforce the gift tax for C4s. And that's another whole paper, so we're not going to talk about that. But, I, but, but basically, <laughs> the IRS has shown no willingness to enforce the gift tax on donations to C4s, even though I think it's pretty clear that they should under the law. And they're, if they're not going to do it there, they're not going to do it here. So it means that I can get money into the corporation tax-free. Now... There is some possible um, implication there, and so one of the things when you'll hear at the end, I have a little way of dealing with that one. The last way is, well, maybe I'm making a capital contribution to the corporation. And so a capital contribution to a corporation, meaning I'm in kind of investing in the corporation's capital, that's not income to the corporation. Now, from a tax perspective, I have to make that capital contribution real. <laughs> Otherwise, the IRS could look through it. And so that's not so hard. I'm going to give ownership rights in exchange for the capital contribution. <coughs> and I'm going to give you the first call on the assets of the organization if it dissolves. So for any of you who've watched Colbert try to transfer his Colbert super PAC shh to himself, right? That wouldn't happen in this kind of instance. The person who would get the money were the people who made capital contributions. So you make it real. So then you have no tax into the organization. So now I've been able to get money into the organization. I've got to give these capital contributions out. No tax to the organization. And now the tax, the organization starts engaging in campaign advocacy. Now it has to follow all the federal election rules, but that's just not so strict right now. And all of the contributors to the organization are likely not going to have to be taxed. Uh, not disclosed. Why? Because their money has been melded with everybody else's. So the corporate spending will be disclosed, but who actually gave it? Now let's see what's so great about this. Here's what's so great about this if you're on the other side, which is my problem, and that is I can do this totally anonymous. I don't have to file a Form 990 with the IRS. I don't have to give information about what my organization does. All I have to do is file articles of incorporation in one of 50 states. And to make matters worse or better, depending on your view, 
Most states have now come out with corporate forms that don't even require a corporation to have a profit motive. So I can form a for-profit taxable entity without a profit motive and engage in campaign activities. So to you know, give you my, my, uh, my consulting bill for not my hourly rate, here's how I set up the organization. I incorporate, set up my corporation in a state that allows for a corporation that doesn't require for-profit motive. I take any contributions below 14000 which is the gift tax amount, the yearly gift tax exemption amount, and I just take those as gifts. And then I take any contributions over a million dollars, because of course I'm not going to bother with the complexity for a $50,000 contribution. I take any contributions over a million dollars as a contribution to capital of the organization, and I give you shares and an ownership interest in the organization in exchange for the contribution. And I'm even going to give you some voting rights, just to make sure that the IRS doesn't come after me and say that this isn't a real organization. Now, why do I think, and, and there are, you know, if we were going to have a long debate, there are tax little holes in here that you could argue, but let me tell you, this is tighter than what the C4s are doing. And if the IRS was not willing to go after the C4s in any serious way, they're going to have a heck of a time going after these organizations, which they barely know exist, they barely know what they're doing, they barely have any regulatory structure, and are not getting, and let me repeat this, are not getting a taxpayer subsidy in the way they think. And so what I say when I'm being really depressed is <laughs> maybe all this C4 stuff doesn't even matter. Maybe all this rulemaking doesn't even matter. Because if we close the C4 loophole, there's this huge loophole with taxable entities. So, at least in my comments to the IRS, besides telling them they should do this with C4s, you know, I said, but you really, if you're going to do this with C4s, you've got to provide some clarity in the rules of taxable entities, because otherwise the taxable <coughs> entities are just going to be the new loophole. Thank you. So um, I'm going to join my panelists and the previous panelists in thanking the law review editors. I think this is a, a great topic and a, and a great piece of we've pulled together here. I also want to thank Phil and Donald for really um, laying out well what the current problems are with the IRS administration in this area and even the future problems uh, if we look forward to one of the likely interactions between political activity and the federal tax rules. Um, what I want to contribute to this is to sort of take a big step back and ask a question not just what the law is and maybe what we'll be seeing people take advantage of the law in the future, but what the law should be here. And I think that raises two fundamental questions. One question is, if we're interested in regulating political activity <coughs> for all the reasons that have been debated in the previous panel and, and the introductory speaker, are the federal tax laws and therefore, by extension, the Treasury Department and the IRS, the right vehicle for doing that regulation to pursue non-tax goals, fighting corruption, um, appearance of corruption, maybe making sure that we have some sort of equality um, or alignment, so forth. And then the second question I have is, even if we find, and I, I'll, I'll explain why I think actually the answer there is no, they're not a good vehicle, even if we think they're not a good vehicle, we still have the issue, and, and Phil and Donald has referenced this, referenced this, that political activity involves movements of money. Tax law involves dealing with movements of money. The tax law cannot ignore political activity, flows of funds. It still has to figure out, is there income? Are there deductions? How do they mesh with tax exempt organizations? And so forth. Um, so let me, let me walk through this. Apparently we have a, a competing speaker. I'll try to speak loud. All right. Okay, so with respect to the first question, there's long been a debate in many different contexts regarding how appropriate it is to use the federal tax laws to implement other types of policies, non-tax policies. I mean, we use them all the time for this, right? You, we want to encourage ownership. There's a mortgage interest reduction. We want to encourage a charitable activity. There's a travel contribution deduction. We want to encourage energy efficiency. You get a deduction or credit for that, too. Oh, you, we want people to have health insurance. Voila. You know, we, we'll put that in the tax code as well, in case you missed that. That's where Obamacare actually resides, uh, for the most part. 
So we use it all the time for these purposes, and so there's been a lot of debate about, well, does it make sense to do so? I mean, it used to be the reaction, and this is probably decades ago now, was, no, no, stay away from the tax code. You know, use, use other things, direct government grant making, direct regulation, that's what should be used for these sort of non-tax goals. Don't mess with our tax system. Um, at least acad academics thought that. Um, now we have a more sophisticated approach, which is, well, maybe. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Let's compare it. Does it make sense? Is a direct government grant program better by whatever measures than using the tax laws? Is a direct regulatory scheme better than using the tax laws to incentivize and disincentivize certain behavior? Um, a good example of this, for example, is the earned income tax credit, uh, which many people say is actually a more efficient, more transparent, and, and less stigmatizing way of redistributing funds to the working poor than having some sort of direct grant program to them. Um, and of course, it's politically more feasible to enact tax cuts than to engage in more government spending. Right? So that's another reason why the tax code often becomes a preferred vehicle for these things. Um, now, as the earlier panel demonstrates, there's a lot of debate over what should the goals be and what constitutionally can they be in terms of regulating political activity. But I'm just going to completely gloss over that um, and assume <laughs> that there are at least some goals we want to pursue uh, collectively. Um, again, by corruption, appearance, corruption, pursuit, encouraging alignment, uh, <coughs> encouraging equality, equality of voice, and so forth. Should we pursue these goals through the federal tax laws? Um, my answer is no for basically three reasons. Um, first, what are the tax laws about? The tax laws, and by extension, again, the agencies that interpret and administer them, are focused on moving money around. Usually we think of it as moving money from me to the government. Um, but it's not that simple, right? Sometimes it's moving actually money from the government to me. The earned income tax credit is a refundable tax credit. You can get money even if you're not paying money. Um, and also, it's sometimes incentivizing moving money elsewhere. Me giving to a charity. Me spending money on energy improvements to my house. Um, and so it's encouraging us to do so and makes the cost of doing that less. The problem is there's a mismatch here between the usual goals of regulating political activity and sort of just incentivizing moving money around or shifting money between the government and people, which is most regulation of political activities are about prohibiting the flows of money, limiting contributions, for example, from individuals to uh, candidates, prohibiting them from corporations and unions to candidates, or disclosing <laughs> political activity. Um, and so, briefly take a 60,000 foot view, there seems to be a, a fundamental mismatch here between what the tax laws generally are designed to do, the agencies that apply them are expert at doing, and what the goals of the tax system, of uh, the political, regular political activity actually are. Second, and relatedly, the congressional committees that consider and draft changes to the tax laws, the Treasury Department and the IRS, are primarily concerned with these moving money around goals. Uh, and sharing sufficient revenue for the government, or for the agencies, the right amount of revenue based on the law that Congress has enacted. Um, creating legal regimes that encourage certain kinds of movements of money and so on. And that means that any other goals take a, have to take a back seat to that primary goal. Raising $220 is not easy. That's what the general revenue laws do. Uh, and raising it in the right way, consistent with all of the rules that Congress has enacted, in case you've seen the length of the Eternal Revenue Code recently, you know, that's not an easy job to do. There are 90,000 employees at the IRS who's trying to handle this. Guess what? Less than 1,000 of them are even thinking about these tax exempt organization issues. Um, and a lot of them are processing the 60,000, 70,000 applications coming over the year, trying to figure out who to audit among the hundreds of thousands of entities out there that are filing annual returns, the Form 990, with the IRS. Indeed, I think one thing that this illustrates is that given the primary mission of, of the IRS, is it really surprising that in the politically fraught area of regulating political activity, they screwed up? You know, that in this whole application mess uh, and, and controversy that's erupted, some low-level employees made what may have been bad decisions <coughs> on how to select the groups to focus on, and then the management, the more senior management involved, didn't correct it in a prompt and, and sufficient manner, which is how, and then, of course, <coughs> apologized publicly in a very awkward and completely ineffectual way. Um, you know, but part of that is just because 
it wasn't, it's not mostly what they're doing. You know, commissioners don't want to get involved with it because this blows up in their face. Acting Commissioner Steve Miller doesn't have a job anymore. You know, because, well, he now has a job. Okay, he has a job. I don't know whether anyone else has a job. You know, but, it, but, it, but it blew up. Right, it blew up. And because their job is primarily deliver the right amount of money to the government, comply with all these complex rules that Congress created, some of which pursue other non-tax policies. So I think there's a problem of, of focus or, or concentration here. And the third, and this is this one I'm still thinking about a bit, the IRS isn't actually politically insulated. You wouldn't know it from listening to all the criticism recently, but there are statutes all over the place that say, you do not interfere with the IRS's selection of who to audit, uh, how to audit them, and so forth. I mean, you being the president, anyone in the White House, oh, and by the way, the political appointees, the, uh, only the IRS Chief Counsel and the IRS Commissioner, <coughs> and at least by long-standing practice, they do not get involved in individual taxpayer decisions. Um, because why? Well, for example, President Kennedy and President Nixon shared one thing in common. They both tried to use the IRS to go after people they didn't like. That's bad, right? We don't like that. And so there are actually statutorily built-in protections for the IRS employees. I remember there was one scandal where supposedly someone in Vice President Gore's office had called the IRS to ask about something, and that IRS employee promptly reported that up the chain as a violation of these statutory provisions and someone got in serious trouble. And of course, and they were, they were actually just trying to find a status on it. They were trying to influence things. Um, but that was enough to sort of set off the alarms. The political insulation, though, I think actually hurts the IRS in regulating political activity in this because it gives them a bit of a tin air to what's going to be politically explosive. An example of this is I remember when the IRS decided to audit the NAACP national, the NAACP on an alleged political activity. I represent the NAACP at that time, which is why I knew about this. And they issued them this letter. Well, the end of it, audits are private. You don't know who's being audited, even tax organizations. But the NAACP decided, hey, it's the Bush administration. They're out to get us. So we're going to go public, wave the letter around. And next thing you know, some line employee, I think in Louisiana, actually, <laughs> got a call. All of a sudden, her phone's going to off the hook because her name was on the letter with all the num with a phone number from the New York Times, USA Today, <laughs> Wall Street Journal saying, what are you doing going after the NAACP? Is this a Bush administration plot? <coughs> this is the last thing a career civil servant wants, right? You know, to be on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> and someone just sort of missed that one of these many groups who are going to offer good activity, they might go public. They might make a big stink out of this. Again, sort of a political tin here. Now, I realize the instant response to this is the FEC is politically non insulated. Its commissioners are appointed through a very political process, and it does a really terrible job in this area. So I'm not saying not being politically insulated is necessarily the ultimate solution, but I think being politically insulated brings its own problems in this area. Um, the bottom line of, of all of this is, and I actually wrote an article many years ago, actually, again, so, so this issue is perennial on them, but it's a gift that keeps on giving to academics. <laughs> um, I wrote an article saying I thought the 527 disclosure laws were actually a problem, because they shouldn't be in the federal tax laws, they shouldn't be administered by the IRS. Even given all its problems, they should be housed in the election laws, and the FEC should administer them. And the FEC had, up till then, actually proven reasonably good at enforcing the election law-based disclosure rules. They certainly had more staff, more accountability, and so forth. And I, I, I would extend a lot of the analysis I made there, though some facts have changed, um, to this more general idea of regulating political activity through the tax law. Okay, but even if you accept that conclusion, and I realize people in the room probably not everyone does, if you accept that conclusion, you still have the problem of, well, but we still have to deal with tax laws. Tax laws still apply to people who give money to politics, still apply to businesses that spend money in politics, still apply to entities that collect money to engage in political activity. What's the right treatment under the tax laws? But just look at tax policy concerns. Um, and today I want to focus on three issues. First. The current rules basically say you have to spend post-tax dollars on political activity. You can't deduct what you spend on politics. That's already been referenced uh, by the other panelists. Second, to what extent is political activity consistent with the various categories of tax organizations we have, as Dr. Donald laid out? And then third, what is disclosure? What role does disclosure play here? Because there is some disclosure already uh, that we have in the tax system, particularly for nonprofit taxes and organizations. To what degree that should that apply to political activity? On the post-tax dollar issue, 
and oversimplifying greatly, and every tax person in the room will now cringe. In general, we don't allow you to deduct personal expenses. You go out and get pizza, tough luck, you can't deduct it. Um, you go and see a movie, you can't deduct it. But you can deduct money you spend to make money. Business expenses, investment income, <coughs> generally you can deduct it to make money. So is political activity more like a personal expense, more like spending money to make money, or is it sometimes one or the other? I would argue that usually it's a political expense. It's a personal preference issue. You support the candidates you want to support, you oppose the ones you oppose. It's a personal decision. Now, we can all imagine scenarios where business says, we got to get this guy elected because their policy is going to really help our business line. But I don't even in that case, the connection with income generation is pretty attenuated because the person you elect, that's not probably going to be the only thing they do, right? They have a host of positions which the business may not care about, but their space going to help get this person in a position to implement a whole range of policies, only a few which impact the business's bottom line. Again, you can probably imagine a very rare situation with someone who has a very narrow set of functions that <coughs> really ties to the business. You know, the insurance commissioner and the insurance company, for example. But I would argue that even in that situation, you could say, well, that's rare enough that as an administrative matter, we're going to have a bright line rule. You can't deduct money that you spend for productivity as a business expense, even if in a few rare cases you could argue it is. And in fact, that's the rule we have in the code section of 162E, supplemented by six. Uh, 6033E, which prohibits you from deducting dues you pay to nonprofits that in turn spend money on political activity, spend that money. A correlate to this conclusion is the rule that was already referenced, which is if you have an entity that can receive tax deductible contributions, like a charity, 51C3 organization, it can't engage in political activity, because that would be a way of getting, spending pre-tax dollars, deductible dollars for political activity. There actually is a gap here in the coverage. Veterans groups can receive deductible contributions, at least in theory, can engage in political activity, though there's a little bit of debate about that. <coughs> As a practical matter, though, that gap, for whatever reasons, has not been used all that much. I'm aware of one or two instances, but for some reason, they didn't go very far. Maybe because it's politically so not palpable, it feels like slimy, like he's a veterans group to do bad to political interests. I mean, even politicians are like, yeah, that doesn't build. That, that might not work anymore. <laughs> um, so what about tax immunization? Should they be allowed to engage in political activity? Setting aside the C3s. You know, these are exempt from tax, but they don't get deductible contributions generally. And I would argue that there's more going on here than the flat statement in the 51C4 regs that, oh, political activity doesn't further social welfare, period, full stop. So you can't do it too much of it. I would argue there's actually a more fundamental problem here, which is for most of these tax and groups, I think all the significant ones, there's a general prohibition on what, I, what in a phrase would be private benefit that is providing benefit to individuals or entities outside the particular collective group you may be willing to benefit. So social welfare is aimed at the community as a whole. Trade associations are aimed at a particular industry, and its members are generally businesses in that industry. Unions are aimed at the workers who are part of that union, and they can certainly work to benefit that group collectively. But for example, I would argue you can't promote the candidacy of one worker because not allowed to benefit the individual worker, just the group collectively. And you certainly can't promote the candidacy of someone outside this group that's private benefit. And so at the minimum, and this is why I think the currency for regs have it wrong, you shouldn't be allowed to gauge and put activity as more than an insubstantial activity or incidental activity. And I believe this comes not from political activity is bad, that's regulating political activity, right? It comes from its private benefit. And private benefit is simply inconsistent with the reason why we grant these groups tax them status. Now, it's still these 527s. Um, what do we do with groups that are dedicated to political activity? I would say, while well, those groups, um, for reasons Donald wrote about in his 2007 article on the that he's touched on here, it does make sense for, them, sense for them to be tax exempt. You can pull your, your post-tax dollars, you can't deduct them, to engage in political activity. It makes sense not to impose a tax at that point. Um, but they're a separate category. That ca that's a separate category organization, separate from these C4s, 5s, and 6s, and we need to keep the categories straight because they will tax them for different reasons. All right, so that sort of sorts things out and maybe even changes things a little bit in the current rules. What about disclosure? What about this issue of what should be disclosed? Now, I'll be clear about two things. First thing, generally under the tax laws, taxpayer information is not disclosed. You file your tax return, it does not end up on the pages of the New York Times. Right? It's buried in a warehouse of the IRS. The IRS employees can get fired or even, even subject to criminal charges if they release that information. And that's to encourage people to actually tell the IRS the truth, right? 
Because you don't want your neighbors and your friends knowing how much money you make. You don't want the advertisers and the direct phone callers to know how much money you make, right? And so it's, it's deemed to both promote privacy as a value, but also to encourage actual true reporting and therefore accurate collection of tax. But we create a big exception to this rule when it comes to tax exempt organizations. In order to facilitate <coughs> the enforcement of the rules for tax exempt organizations, we generally do require them. <coughs> so if you are Valparaiso University, you have to file a Form 990, an annual return, which is a public document, guidestar.org, for those of you who want to see how much the president gets paid, or I don't name how much the football coach gets paid. Um, but you can pull up this form. You can see all the activities they engage in. You can see the finances and money flows. Um, you can see even compensation of top officials and board members and top employees. Why? Because we're worried they're going to use their influence in the organization to get more money than they deserve for the services they're providing. Again, no today football coach, you can pay them as much as you want. But everyone else only should get paid as much as they're actually worth. Um, <laughs> and, but you can see that, so we violate the privacy of these employees. I mean, some people are really horrified. I work for, I'm president of the university, also my salary is out there for everyone to see. Yes, because we want the public and media to help the IRS enforce the standard that you can't take more than your services are worth. Because you're not allowed to take profits out of the, out of the charity. Um, we require donors to private foundations to be disclosed publicly. Why? Because the Congress decided back in 1969 that these donors, through their influence over the foundations, which you know the small group of donors funds, could use the foundation to depart from the charitable um, purposes it's supposed to be serving. And there wasn't other constituencies to keep it accountable, so we want the public and media to know who's funding the Gates Foundation. Okay, the name slapped on you, so no, but did you know Warren Buffett gives money? Well, now we know because we have the donor schedule. And we can see whether Warren Buffett is unduly using the foundation for his own benefit, violating the very basis for why they get to be a charity. Does these sort of reasoning extend to public activity? And here, I'm going to actually say something uh, that departs from, I think, my fellow panelists, which is, as much as I think disclosure actually makes sense, especially if significant donors to public activity, I don't think it makes sense as a tax policy matter. And that goes back to my conclusion that I don't think the 527 disclosure rules should reside in the tax laws and be administered by the IRS. Now, when I say all this, I'm, I, when I came to this conclusion, I started to wonder, am I being, as Van would put it, a brain-damaged academic? Am I have my ivory tower the tax code should be pure thing when we're talking about the demise of democracy? And if it's easier to get these sort of regulating political activity provisions of clean disclosure through the tax laws than in the election law because of the way Congress is structured and so forth, let's do it. Because something is better than nothing. I think the answer to that is that's not taking everything into account. Because what you're trying to take into account is the something may give you some regulation of political activity that you think is desirable. But at the cost, the IRS screen it up. And not just screen up regulation of political activity, but screen up so badly, the C4 mess being an example, that it damages the IRS's ability to regulate the entire exemplarization sector. I think this whole scandal is going to create, make IRS employees incredibly gun-shy, going after other things. Um, and maybe even damage the ability of the IRS to do its primary job, which is to collect $2 trillion in taxes to fund the federal government in a way that's fair and yet rigorous. Um, and it, the whole scale, just, you know, when the IRS screws it up, and I'm going to say when, when they screw this up, because they're not allowed to do this, they're going to be distracted from the main mission, the main mission is going to suffer, and the main mission is still important. And you have to think about the cost of having the IRS in the business of regulating political activity and messing it up. And again, I would say it will mess it up because of all the institutional constraints it faces into account and balance that against the, what you think is the benefit of having the regulation happen through the federal tax laws because you can't get it politically enacted elsewhere.